Hey all, it's Lanesh Devotee here again, and uh, I thought I'd do another bit of a look over some of these new fan expansions. So I'm going to look at Promise of War, the force, first war pack from the um, APOCA fan card group. start off, they've added Warlords in their expansions. Uh, the first one is Shaper Agnok, Crute Warlord. So the Crute are the alien, um, the main alien race that's part of the Tau Empire. The Crute are a race of carnivorous bird-like descendants um, and they will devour their prey and their opponents and they will take on genetic qualities of those opponents in the typical 40k sort of advanced ridiculous crazy sort of way so a shaper is the uh, sort of the leader of a crew group and they're a shaper because they shape the way the crew um, evolve in a sense so we can see him there with his hunting rifle the crew are well known as sneaky jungle sort of fighters and uh, you can see there's a huge blade on the end of the, the hunting rifle, which is because they're really vicious close combat warriors. Uh, Agnok is riding a Krutox, or some sort of beast like that, which is basically just a Krut creature that's been uh, evolved to be a big riding monster. I quite like the idea that he's playing into that Krut having no command, um, and, and creating a way for you to still be able to gain some resources and cards there. I think that that's really nice to emphasize the crew don't sort of control an area but they use it. So I think that's cool. His signature unit are Agnox Shadows, which is quite a nice sort of name for these guerrilla ambushy style sort of fighters. Two for two, three but no command. That all sort of seems reasonable. And, and you exhaust them um, to do negative two attack, so they sort of disable their opponent, but when they do that, they have to move out of the way. So I think that's a pretty decent uh, Krut Gorilla tactic sort of style there, that's cool. The signature event is behind em enemy lines. Uh, deploy and not put into play, deploy, I made that mistake. A Krut unit at a planet and exhaust a non-elite enemy army unit. So one for deploy a unit at a target planet as a surprise event I think is really good. I think that's almost enough as it is. Adding then exhaust a not elite enemy army unit. Uh, I can see how that ties into the crew flavor, but it makes it a really strong event, I think. Um, the attachment is the Vanguard pack. So these are crew hounds, which again, like the crew talks, are uh, evolved creatures of crew genetic lineage. They're more like dogs or hunting packs. Um, so this, you, you put the pack onto a planet and they disrupt the enemy as they arrive, which seems good. Paying to get rid of them, I don't think that's particularly based on the law, but it gives, it fits into the theme of the warlord a bit, so I think that's okay. And evolutionary adaptation, as I already covered, so that's what they do, and I think this is really quite a good, I like it's a bit wordy, it's a bit complicated, but it covers it quite well. You choose a unit that you've already killed, and you take it out of the game entirely, so it's been fully devoured, and then you can give a Krut army unit their keyword. So flying, or mobile, or anything like that. And I think that's, I think overall this is a really cool, fluffy way to show a Krut style fight, uh, warlord and warriors and things. I think it's pretty cool. The Space Marines cards are both Space Wolves for this pack. First they have the attachment, the unique tracked objective. Uh, it can't go on the first planet. And forced reaction, so it happens regardless of, of what's going on. Sacrifice the attachment, so it blows up anyway. Deal two damage to a warlord if able, so enemy if you can, but if you're the only one there it'll hit you. And then it replaces itself. I think that, that shows a trapped objective. I think that sort of style thing, I think that's a really good way of showing it. But... Don't know if it's a particularly space marine way of doing things, particularly space wolves. I see how it fits into the idea with Ragnar of the hunter and sort of limiting where their warlord goes. So it fits the space wolf warrior, the warlord, the, the cards. But I, space marines, I don't see trapping things so often, leaving traps, booby traps. They're, you know, shock troops. They get in and they confront the enemy and they 
devastate them, and traps seems like something more, something the Inquisition or the Imperial Guard might do, it's sort of sneaky and, and, and a way to get around the fact that they're smaller and weaker than whatever their enemy is. The pinning Razorback. Razorback is like, a, I don't know if there's a Rhino card yet, it's a transport used by the Space Marines, it's quite light armoured, which allows it to move quite quickly, and also because the Space Marines themselves are so heavily armoured, they don't need a lot of armour. Um, but a Razorback carries less people and has big mounted uh, guns, so it works with Space Marines for driving in, confronting the enemy really heavily, straight on. Pinning... Uh, with the heavy bolters that are mounted on there, the rapid-fire, explosive, uh, large-caliber weapons that they have. Uh, I like that. You, you pin the enemy down, you blast away at them, and they can't do much. And in this case, can't be declared as an attacker during the opponent's next combat turn. The timing on that is, is tricky, um, but, but pinning something down so it can't attack, something else has to attack. I'm not sure what happens if you have a one enemy and you pin it. Surely it can never then attack, or does the combat turn get lost? So I'm a little confused about how that one will work exactly. Katachan Devil Patrol, Katachan Devils Patrol. So the Katachan Devils are the Imperial Guard soldiers from Katachan. Katachan is Death World, it's a massive jungle full of monsters and horrible things, and the Imperial Guard from there are known to be basically Rambo. You know, they're really good jungle fighters and they're improvisers and they're, they're deadly. Uh, so this one, again it's deploy, not put into play. So basically these guys are, you're ambushing them in a sense, and uh, then your opponent can either back off whatever they were attacking and, and withdraw a little bit, cancelling the remainder of the attack, or they can, can move forward but take a, a strong hit. Okay, so I think that works as the, the jungle fighters stepping in and causing problems. The Siege Regiment Manticore. The Manticore is a Imperial Guard artillery piece with massive, massive, massive death rockets that it launches, so that's cool. And, which is great, I, now this is one of those cards where the scale of 40k Conquest is a bit confusing, because it's firing through space at another planet, I think we've all kind of taken on that the planets are more like territories on a planet, um, just the, the level of the, uh, the scale of the game doesn't support them being different planets really, it's more like battlefields, um, but yeah, it can shoot at an adjacent battlefield, which is really cool. I quite like, if you actually attack it at its planet, it can't shoot at you. So it doesn't get its sort of semi-ranged effect, um, and you have a chance to attack it up close where it can't defend itself quite as easily. Okay, Noble Shining Spears. So as I've spoken before, the Shining Spears are one of the um, Eldar aspects. So it's a warrior aspect, you train to become proficient and then you step aside and put that aside and, and move on to something else. The Shining Spears, uh, their aspect of war is um, yeah, mounted cavalry, you know, they have what's called a laser lance, you can see it's coming up off the unit there, and they, they yeah, charge in like a knight in a sense, and um, that's the aspect of war they follow. When we say aspect, it's because they are trying to embody the different aspects of their war god, Kayla Menshar Kain. Um, and Kayla Mensch Kain is yeah, the Eldar god of war, one of the only gods that they have still alive after the birth of Slanesh. Actually, that's another thing that would be really cool to see as an avatar. Um, avatar of Kain. In the 40k tabletop game, the avatar of Kain is this massive monster of a Eldar embodiment of a war god and it's brutal and it's made of molten metal or it's armor and you can see the heat rising from underneath it and it's really really cool. The Eldar um, perform a sacrifice to awaken the Avatar in times of war and what happens is they get the exarchs from the various aspect shrines and they choose one that they name the Young Prince and he walks into the shrine and then uh, they close the doors, and the avatar of Cain walks out with bloodied hands. He's, he's called Cain, the bloody-handed god, and the young prince is never seen again. So it's an Eldar sacrifice to awaken their god of war. 
uh, he'd be a great monster of a card. I'd love to see him. Anyway, the Shining Spears, good command. Tough, they're mobile. That all makes sense for a jet pike, cavalry type sci-fi unit. Zero attack, plus three attack while attacking an undamaged unit. I think that kind of works quite well. It encourages them to take on new targets and to jump around and fight against the most... Um, you know, dangerous thing on the battlefield, which is that nobility, that knight sort of style. I think that works. Um, a mobile unit is assigned damage, reassign one to this unit. That, I, I don't know if that's really necessary. I don't know if that really makes a lot of sense for the Shining Spears. I, I don't see them as defenders in that sense. I see them as, you know, knights attacking a dragon, heading out and hitting the biggest thing they can find. Um, dodging into the way of others and taking some of their the fire for them. I, I'm not sure if that makes as much sense. Clash of Wings is an event. Plan it with your Warlord until the end of the round. Every mobile unit there gains flying. That makes sense. There used to be a um, ability for the in 40k the tabletop for uh, various things to fly high, or uh, I can't remember exactly what the term was, but basically they would fly above the battlefield, beyond the reach of most weaponry, and then come back down later in a different area of the battlefield. And I think this mimics that. It makes them um, harder to hit in the battle, and uh, I think that's quite a cool effect, especially if you use it with Baharoth, and uh, Baharoth suddenly gains flying. So I think that's cool. That makes, matches up, that makes sense to me. Strangleweb Termigan, a new one cost one hammer for Tyranids. We all knew that they wanted them. Uh, the Strangleweb is the weapon that they're carrying. The Strangleweb, uh, all weapons of the Tyranids are their own unique small creatures that are carried by the other creatures and often grown as a part of, like a parasite of the other creatures. And I believe the strang Strangleweb is a fires like a seed that explodes into a huge uh, web of vines and um, entraps the enemy. Um, which makes sense for this, would move from this planet to another planet, you can cancel the move. That makes a lot of sense for a strangle web using unit, it slows things down as they try to get away. Um, the only thing with it is that we actually already have uh, Termigant Stranglers as a FFG card, which is exactly the same uh, Tyranids. <laughs> you know, so that, that seems a bit weird. There's two cards that are the same creature, really, and they do two different things, which is a bit kind of odd, but that's alright. Rain of Mycetic Spores. Mycetic Spores are the things that um, come from the hive ships and infest the planet when the Tyranids first arrive. It's the spores that eventually give rise to all the beasts that destroy the planet. So this is a limited, it attaches to a planet, um, and then slowly but surely it can infest all the planets around it, which uh, I think works quite well. I don't know how useful as a card it is for anyone that really wants infestation, but you can, as I say, slowly but surely infest a section. The only orc card that's included in this pack is called Runts to the Front. Uh, it's a snotling tactic, which I quite like, being snotling, that's cool. Um, enemy unit declares an attack against a unit you control, declare a ready Runt unit as the defender. So the snots get crumped, runs to the front, throw the snotlings in the way and let them do the dying. Get their gunk under your boots. Now that, that is an orc card. I mean, I can't, I can't deny that at all. And the flavor text, ready, aim, fight, no, wait, wait, not. That's pretty good too, you know, that, that, the Imperial Guard just stopping and going, wait, no, that's not what we wanted to shoot at. Oh my goodness, there's some monstrous thing following behind. We're screwed. Yeah, so that's a good card. That's a good one. Corn cards. Uh, straight away, we're looking for uh, things to back up Barzul, apparently. We have Everlasting Rage. Remove damage from a corn unit, and that gives it the same amount of uh, attack. And actually, it's based on the number of corn units. Um, which I think, that's not a bad idea. It's like the bloodthirsty mob and you've got a huge amount of mob, like the more mob you have, the better you can heal and take damage and keep fighting, the more destructive you can be. I think that's a pretty good combination, I like that. I think that works quite well as a bloodthirsty mob sort of card. Raging Demon Host. 
So this idea of possession taking over somebody, and it's got this brutal artwork of a uh, of what appears to be an Imperial Guardsman slowly corrupting from within, so that's really cool. 3-3 uh, three, three with no hammer for 4, obviously it's terrible. It's a cultist and a demon, so there's quite a few different cultist tricks you can play. Demon means you can get them in cheaper with other cultists, which is interesting. When this card leaves play, attach it to an army unit you control at the same planet as an attachment, because obviously uh, it's actually an army unit otherwise. Um, not to demons, not to vehicles, gains basically the effect of the demon host by itself on top of. Um, it's interesting, the idea that the possession jumps from person to person. I just, I'm not sure what makes that particularly corn rather than Sinch or Slanesh or even Nurgle, like any demon could have it. I'm not sure why it's corn traded. It could just be a raging demon host, demon cultist, and not give corn trade, and it would still be, um, yeah, I, I would still think it's about the same. I like the idea of it jumping to somebody else and boosting up. Um, eventually, when it would leave play, and there's no army unit at the planet that works, it, it will disappear, so it's not terrifying in that sense to behold. That's okay, that's alright. Just the one Dark Elder here, but it's a torture event for my buddy Urian. Yeah. Uh, after an army unit enters play at a planet, move that unit to adjacent planet of your choice. It makes sense. That works. That, I feel like, is the sort of torture style that we're used to here. That's disruption, the ruining your plans. Urian can play it for two. Just move your unit. It's fine. It's not amazing. It doesn't really seem like something I'm going to use in my torture decks, my Urian decks. Um, I'm sure you could find some really interesting things to do with it, but I just... It's not that great. It's okay. Um, Flavor-wise, moving a unit somewhere else, Catatonic Pain. Um, it works as a torture in the general, general sense, you know, like... The torch cards are things that you don't want played against you, they're going to mess with your plan. But inflicting catacomb pain, I like the name of it, that works. I just, I'm not sure why that would move a unit. It sounds more like something that would exhaust a unit or reduce the attack of a unit like suffering does. I don't know. It's okay. Necron cards here, we have the replicating scarabs, clearly from Illuminor Zaris. Um, exhaust the unit to remove one damage from a Necron army unit. Incredibly straightforward. They generate their own uh, economy through that, through um, Xeris. Um, it's good. They have no command hammer, so they're like a lot of the drones. They're not that useful in that sense. But there's a few drone effects in the Necron card pool that they can be used for master program. And uh, I'd love to see more ways of using drones, more low-cost drones that can be sacrificed or, or moved or something to have different Necron effects, that would be really cool. The Ghost Arc of Orican, it's unique, which is interesting, so it's it's not just a Ghost Arc, it's the particular Ghost Arc of this fighting area. Now, as far as I understand, the Ghost Arcs are the transport vehicles for the Necrons. They're basically, you can see in the background, the sort of horsehead shaped thing. Um, apparently that's the the arc, and I believe while they're in Necron Warriors, uh, sort of in dormant states on the ghost arcs, they also have some sort of a teleport technology, so they'll generate more Necrons from wherever the Necrons come from, I think, similar to the, um, the monolith, but on a smaller scale. I may have that wrong. It may just be that they have Necron Warrior dormant state on and they just keep pumping them off wandering out um so it's a vehicle it's got no war gear that's all good all the stats fine when a necron soldier or warrior you control at this planet is destroyed by an attack put one into play with lower printed cost from your discard pile exhausted at this planet so basically you just keep recycling down you start at a 
you know, uh, what are they called, the, the Praetorians, a bi-cost soldier, I'm pretty sure. And then you can put in a 4, and then a 3, and then a 2, and then a 1 if you've got them. Uh, the Warriors of Gibram are a 1-cost warrior, I believe. So I just, I, I love it. I put together a deck that would use this straight away. I haven't really been able to try it out much yet. Um, and <laughs> it's... It sounds so cool, this endless wave. It's almost impossible to set up. <laughs> but uh, the idea of it's fantastic. It's exactly what I like to see the, for that different ways of showing the endless, the ceaseless tide of metal that is the Necron. Uh, the undead skeletal warriors just walking always forward. I love it. It's good. It's good. And then we have the neutral card Calibration Error. Now, something about the name of this card, to me, makes it feel like it's quite limited, but then I've thought about uh, SDC Fragment would only be relevant to a few of the armies, and the other armies, there's no reason an SDC Fragment should improve the cost of a, a Tyranid Elite, let alone potentially Necron or Elder. I don't know how well they'd want old Imperial technology when they've got their own, you know. Um, but it's a disaster, which is fun to see another disaster trait. And although it seems like a lot of text, it makes sense. After an enemy, non-warlord unit moves from a planet to another planet, exhaust it. So it's crashed, it's exhausted. Then, have your opponent deal amount of indirect damage equal to that unit's printed attack value among non-warlord user control at the same, he controls at the same planet. So it crashes, it exhausts, and then it smashes into things or you know and i think that's really good uh it shows them crashing that's fine uh it is a bit specific in a way that kind of doesn't work for some armies but so are other cards that we've seen um and it's really really useful when we've seen possessed flying around from planet to planet hell drakes bouncing from planet to planet throw a calibration error in the middle of that suddenly the game slows down a little bit again. Um, though all those Eldar elites bouncing around. Um, yeah, I think I think it's the sort of card that is a good thing to have in the mix. Um, yeah, so it's pretty good. And that's all the Apoca cards. So um, I, I've been enjoying looking at them. I've tried to bring them to my local gaming shop. Um, I'm trying to play them on Octagon a bit more often, and uh, I hope that you're enjoying getting something new, even though uh, Conquest is gone. Um, let me know how you found them. See you!